Hey everyone, hi, welcome, hello from Philadelphia. I'm Shar Nolan, a plant-based chef in Philadelphia where my goal is to feed people nutritious and delicious plant-based food. So happy to see so many of you here. Have loved all of the questions. This topic of living in a house divided because of plants is such an important one and one that I have lived for 11 years and all in goodness and all in love. So I love all the questions. I thought I would just start out with a little anecdotal story because in real life, I'd like to be a stand-up comedian. I don't usually tell people that. So uh, I have the, the pleasure of having a, a very good friendship with Ann Esselstyn and I've known Ann for as long as I have been plant-based. And after I went to the uh, inaugural Engine 2 immersion in Austin, Texas in 2010, she was very eager to see how I was going to implement all of this in my home because I let her know that my husband thought that my 28 day challenge that became a lifelong endeavor was questionable. So I see her after six months and she goes, how's everything going? And I said, oh my gosh, it's going so great. She said, well, what are you making? And I said, well, I'll give you an example, Anne, for Taco Tuesday. I will make a beautiful filling with lots of green vegetables and a freshly made pico de gallo and everything is so delicious. And I finished the sentence with, but I leave a bowl of cheese on the table so that my husband will eat it. And she took my hand and she slapped it. And I realized at that very moment that when I got back to Philadelphia, that I had a lot of work to do in terms of taking this platform of being plant-based and leaning into my family with lots of love so that I could live a happy life and that I wouldn't be judgmental, that I wouldn't be negative, but that I would honor whatever it is that they wanted to do as well. So that's what brings me here because <clears throat> I don't run a restaurant. I make one dinner a night. If anyone, meaning my husband, wants to supplement that, he has to go to the grocery store and buy the animal protein, cook it in designated plant protein pots because I don't want anybody touching my great Jones stainless steel beautiful pots and pans that I love so much. Anyway, that's what brings me here. I'm happy. We're, there, I know there's some really great questions. I, I just want to tell you one. Other quick story, um, in, in a, in a pre-COVID life, uh, one of the things that I would utilize in my practice of helping people set up a plant-based kitchen is that I would go to their home, in parentheses, they're always people who I know. I would go to their home, we would do a rocket clean out of their kitchen. The next visit, uh, we would go to a grocery store and People think that if they're plant-based, they automatically have to go to an organic grocery store like Sprouts or Whole Foods. But the reality is that you want to establish a base of comfort with people and have them shop where they like to shop because it's what they know, it's who they know. They know the guy in produce, they know the guy at the, the or the person at the checkout. Anyway, uh, and then the third thing is I would go back a third time and teach them how to cook one basic meal that could either be Mexican, Italian, French, Asian. It would primarily be a brown rice, some vegetables, very similar to what Jeff Novick does when he teaches his classes. And I've been to many of Jeff's lectures and really credit him for helping me get on this path uh, to wellness that I choose to live. So anyway, that's sort of it in a nutshell. But the other thing that I do before anything is I have everyone watch Forks Over Knives. This is an original postcard from the original screening here in Philadelphia, the first one ever in the country from 2010. And it's a relic and I don't know, I should probably get it framed after all these years, but if you have anyone in your friend circle, in your family circle, if you have a life partner who is in question, the two movies that I like to recommend, and they're both old school, one is Forks Over Knives and the other one is Vegucated. Two very different approaches, same terrific message. Ready for some questions? Okay, I wish I could see all of you live shaking your head yes. And I see so many familiar faces here, so it makes me feel really, really happy and comfortable. So, Kelly, this is your question. You're up first. What are the best love dishes for those who are plant-based and non-plant-based? Oh, Kelly, I've been cooking two meals for my family for a long time. 
because they do not like what I prepare. I'm the plant-based one. Kelly, we could be best friends, but here's the thing. Anything that I have ever eaten in my entire life, a family favorite. Uh, and one of the things that you might like to do is have your family give you an inventory of their favorite dishes and then think of a way that you can almost identically flip that traditional recipe to equal one that is very nutrient dense and totally delicious. Here's a quick example. My sainted grandmother, Mary Monteruli, always made potatoes in the oven. And there were potatoes and they had to be cut a certain way and there were fresh tomatoes and she would have some kind of meat protein in it. But the trick to it was always basting the dish with the celery leaves and this very special mustard garlic concoction that she, that she had. So without fat and without animal product, you can still retain some of those flavors. So um, Jane Esselstyn has a new book coming out soon and she is featuring some wellness warriors and I happen to be one of them and my contribution to the book is my grandmother's uh, chichi bean dish, which is essentially uh, uh, garbanzo beans and ditalini pasta. It doesn't have Locatelli Romano cheese in it, but I make my own cheese with nutritional yeast and ground walnuts that gives it that same umami. So involve your family, bring them in, lean in with love, and I think this will work. I totally think this will work. But the one thing that I always recommend to people is to start out with Meatless Monday. So there are four, there will be four days in a month that everyone knows that when they sit down to the table, they're going to have a meatless dish. And this is a great campaign because it is international. Sir Paul McCartney is one of the uh, spokespeople. And interestingly, uh, this campaign in the United States is run by the Humane Society. And <clears throat> vegans loved this logo. I'll move it in closer so you can see it. The vegans loved it. The non-vegans were scared to death of it because they thought that it was almost militant. So what they did instead was they got together and they have a new logo that says more plants, less meat. And then there's lots and lots of pictures of um, vegetables on there. So Meatless Monday, go to meatlessmonday.com. They've got great ideas, simple recipes, but again, don't give them something foreign. Give them something that they know that's delicious. And Kelly, I, I, in a month, I want you to like email me and tell me that you're only making one meal a month. Everyone loves a salad. Everyone loves a dessert. You might want to start with dessert as well. Hope that uh, answered your question. Hi, Susie R. Eating much more veggies, but not completely plant-based yet. You're in your in your 60s female and you're concerned about your bone density. How do I get enough protein and calcium if I go completely plant-based? What foods in particular are good for bone density? Well, I never buy age as um, a factor of why one would not go plant-based. I was, um, I'm much older than you are. And I can tell you that my bone density is way above nine because I get all of my calcium from fortified plant milk, some fortified cereals, even though I don't eat a lot of those, and lots of leafy greens and legumes. Collard greens have a third of the amount of calcium in them as does a glass of milk. And I don't know many people who drink several glasses of milk a day. So lean in with the leafy greens, Lean in with lots of legumes, find a favorite one that you like, and um, you know oatmeal and other grains. So I think that would be my answer to you, and I hope that's a helpful one. Could you, hi Ann, uh, could you please comment on what kind of veggie scrap bag you keep in your freezer for future stock? What are your favorites? Well, here's the thing. Sometimes I don't always have scraps because I like the skin of vegetables. I love how uh, potato peels get so crispy in my air fryer. And I uh, love uh, a well-scrubbed carrot. 
because when I think of the nutrients of a carrot, I think of it underground and all the minerals from the soil going into that carrot, you know, making me the closest thing to Popeye that there is. However, um, onion, the ends of an onion, even the onion skins, because that will add a beautiful color to the broth that you are making. Ends of an eggplant, um, the butt of celery, anything that you would ordinarily throw away, uh, just throw it in a freezer bag and keep it in your freezer. I always date it because sometimes I have forgotten that it was in there and four years later, there is this bag of, I don't even know what it is. So just you, instead of throwing things away, throw them in a bag, date it, and you will have the most delicious and nutrient dense uh, stock that you could have. So let me know how you make out with that. This is my first event. Hello, Demetrius K. This is my first event because I'm off. Well, congratulations. I'm Canadian of Greek origin. I grew up with the Mediterranean diet. Olive oil is a staple. Forks over knives is against all, uh, all oils. Can you convince me why? Um, I can convince you in one simple and easy way, and it has to do with your cardiovascular system. And the fact that oils can irritate the endothelial linings of your arteries, causing inflammation. And that's the reason that Dr. Esselstyn would give to you if he were sitting right next to me. He's not sitting next to me, but his book is. Uh, and that's the reason why. So let me just go back to a second to help you out there, Demetrius. If you um, have ever tried the no oil saute for the mushrooms that we have here on Ruby, that to me is sort of like the hallmark of learning how to make delicious food without oil. It's a hundred times better than water saute because I personally find that water saute creates a sogginess and it doesn't give you that same caramelization that you really love to have. And I also have to say that uh, developing a taste for not having oil in your foods uh, is something that does take some time. I'm Italian. I grew up in a house where you always had a gallon of olive oil in your kitchen. And aside from using it in meals and cooking, you polished your shoes with it. You polished your furniture with it. My grandmother used it on her face. She never had a wrinkle uh, and she lived to be 98 years old. So, uh, you know, I, I am always reminded that food is very personal. Food is a big history in our lives. It's part of who we are. And sometimes if a health reason is a reason why you need to surrender using something like oil, I would put my health before my culture, but I have a feeling, Dimitri, that you will find a way to uh, remedy the situation for yourself. Do I have any favorite recipes that are a great hit with family on the standard? Uh, you mean they come from, oh, okay, I got it. people on the standard American diet. So you know what's really good in um, the Engine 2 cookbook is the Raise the Roof lasagna that Rip has. It's a great recipe. Of course, like any, um, any chef, I've made, you know, my own changes to it. And I love the um, tofu ricotta that we have here on Ruby that makes such a perfect filling and makes the most delicious tender lasagna. So you can never go wrong with Italian. You can never go wrong with Asian dishes. Just make sure that you are loading that plate up with, and for those of you who have already submitted your hospital assignment, you always hear me say leafy greens, legumes, and grains, and minimal to no SOS, meaning salt, oil, or sugar. Um, but anything that you like can be converted. You, you have to become your own kitchen magician, so to speak. And desserts are also a great way to sort of enter into the world. Maybe your family's not ready for you to make a meatless chili, but they are ready for you to make a delicious black bean brownie. And no one will even know that it's black beans. All right. This is from, uh, oh, Anne again. I'd be grateful to know how to help family and friends understand that when in a restaurant, I can figure out what to order. It's common for people to offer unwanted advice on how to navigate the food options and tell me what I could eat. Ugh. Well, 
that has happened to me. And um, I have to get a switch in my brain that says they are doing this because they care about you. With that said, going to a steakhouse is hands down the easiest place to go because you can get a beautiful baked potato. You can get some lovely, gorgeous uh, grilled or steamed vegetables. And I, I always think of this, that when I go out to eat with people, a month later, I'm not going to remember what I ate. I'm going to remember who I was with. And I might remember a funny story that we told at dinner. So I think that um, you can let them know that you've handled this. You can also call the restaurant in advance and then easily say at the dinner table, oh, I spoke to the chef earlier tonight. Everything is under control. And I bet that when the food arrives to the table, they're going to say, oh, my God, how did you get that? Because that's what happens all of the time. This is from Kelly A. What is the best type of stone to start out with when learning to sharpen a knife? Um, you know, I, I have, uh, you're going to laugh. I have an Emeril Lagasse stone that I love. It's easy. It's quick. I can clean it. That might be more of a technical, excuse me, technical question for someone like Eric, but my knives, I shop, sharpen them regularly. They can cut paper. They're still in good shape. And I got to thank Emeril Lagasse for that. I love pureed veg soups, but do I lose the benefit of the fiber if I puree? You do not use the benefit of the fiber of the puree. However, if you, let's say, if you were a juicer, that's where you lose the fiber. So um, if your family likes pureed soups, stick with the pureed soups. The other day I made a, a soup with, um, it was clean out day. So it had mushrooms, a mirepoix and a simple stock. And then I added a cup of oatmeal to it. And it was this creamy, delicious soup that I garnished with romaine lettuce. And the romaine lettuce got nice and wilty and creamy. So maybe add a little texture to the uh, puree, but you'll have all the fiber that you need. That's a great question, by the way. Hello, Dennis. Why plant-based? Well, that could be a talk show of its own. But in a nutshell, uh, many people who I know have become plant-based because they simply wanted to feel better. They wanted to have uh, to reach their optimal health outcomes. Some people I know who are plant-based do it for the environment. Some people who I know that are plant-based do it for animal compassion. So you kind of like have this trifecta of reasons why uh, you might consider going plant-based. For me personally, um, I don't mind sharing with you that I have two parents, each of whom died from cancer and heart disease. And I have um, siblings who are around my age who make fun of me for eating the way that I do. However, they are physically a mess. And I take no medications. I have no diseases. I lead a very productive life. I'm out on my bicycle. I'm pointing outside, not today because it's sort of snowing. But um, I think those are the easy reasons. But I could go on and on forever about that. Hello, Laura C. COVID has eliminated the issue of feeding out of town visitors, but they keep talking about when they do finally visit. They know we have been a plant-based house for over a year. Congratulations. And my husband simply says, they eat what we cook and they will love it. And give your husband the bonus ticket to the bonus round because he is 100% correct. That's it. That's it. Unless they're paying your mortgage, you, you make whatever you want to make in your house. So I'm coming to your house. I don't know where you live, but I love you already. Oh, hi, Mary P. I as well teach plant-based culinary classes in San Diego. Hello. Uh, where we have, whoops, where we have uh, beautiful weekly farmer's markets. The one question I get over and over again, do we need to buy organic? They are concerned about the cost of food. I personally do not buy organic all the time, but I um, do that trick 
for example, let's say an apple where I hold it with a tongue and pour boiling water with it and any toxins that might be on it uh, or any residue from whatever comes off, you can literally see it come off. Just make sure you wash your vegetables well. The trick of course is to come home, uh, de-stem, de-vein, whatever, wash them well, dry them and then store them in your refrigerator so that you always have them at the ready because you never want to waste your greens. I would love to know, Mary, what exactly you do in San Diego. I'm all about community education. What is a good source of determining seasonal vegetables for my geographic location? Also, where do vegetables come from in and out of season, South America, Mexico, California, et cetera? Kevin, this is a great question. Um, Melissa's Produce, it's a national uh, warehouse of produce. Every quarter, she puts up on her Instagram account a really wonderful diagram, just a simple diagram of what's in season. Um, there's a fabulous uh, vegan sushi restaurant in New York City called Beyond Sushi. Follow Beyond Sushi on social gram. Chef Guy does the same thing. He will tell you what is in season right now. I am getting my vegetables from the Culinary Vegetable Institute of America from the chef's garden. So every other week, I get lots of root vegetables, which are in season now. Kale is still in season. Tubers are still in season. In terms of fresh fruit, most of your fresh fruit is going to come from Mexico. Right now, I'm not buying, I haven't seen any in a while, but I am not buying anything that is coming from Brazil just because I'm trying to really contain uh, my, uh, my fruit, my fruit origins specifically. So that's what I have for that answer. Hello, Janice. How do I get my husband to eat more greens? He's whole food plant-based, but sticks mostly to mushrooms and potatoes and pasta. Not good. Hope the pasta is whole wheat, first of all, or if not whole wheat, a good quality gluten-free uh, like a barilla or a banza or a tinkiata. Those are my three favorite brands. So um, I'm thinking out loud, soups are a great way to incorporate more greens. If you get a nice chiffonade cut on that kale, you know, roll it up, little thin slices. Uh, it looks so beautiful. It looks so colorful. I do not recommend smoothies, uh, but we can go back to making that pureed soup. But I think, here's the thing, Dr. Esselstyn recommends six cups of greens a day. And that sounds like so much, but if you take six cups of raw spinach, for example, and you saute it with some garlic, and I know that you're all really good experts with garlic and that you're not gonna burn the garlic to get that bitter taste. Those six cups of spinach end up being sort of like a four ounce serving. So there's a great way to do that. Go grocery shopping together, have him pick out, let's try a new green each week. Let's do kale this week. Let's do collards next week. Um, you have all seen um, that um, where you take a tortilla and you cut it down the middle and then you make a sort of sandwich wrap. Well, I've been doing that with collards and um, I make it with ruby tuna fish and everyone loves it. So you just have to be a little, little innovative and creative and not be afraid of the reaction, but think about the benefit instead. Hope that answered your question. This is from Eileen. What about if you don't want meat in your meatless pots? I'm not sure that I understand that question, but I earlier made reference to the fact that I have pots that are designated just for me and the old pots uh, my husband uses for meat and there's an M on them for meat, not for me, but meat. And uh, that's the easiest way that, that I know of at all. Hope that helps. Um, are there ways to get the benefits of the autoimmune protocol diet, which is primary, primarily paleo based but on a whole food plant-based diet instead. I don't feel comfortable answering that question because I don't know enough about the autoimmune protocol as it's paleo related. 
I can tell you from a point of view of being whole food plant based, greens, grains, legumes, minimal salt, oil, and sugar. Hello, Karen. Do you think Ruby would be willing to do live cooking demonstrations as part of their live events? I find watching a live cooking demo helps me gain better understanding. Just wondering. Well, last week, Fran Kostikin gave a stellar, stellar uh, live cooking event uh, from her home, and it was delightful. And I have done live cooking events for other organizations, and perhaps this is something that we can take to the table. And uh, that is a very good question. Thank you so much. Hi, Christy. I have not found a nutritional yeast I like. Do I have a brand that I prefer? So I think I'm curious to know why you haven't found a brand you don't like, because some of the nutritional yeast brands seem to have flakes that are the size of snowballs. And I personally find that very off-putting. Um, but I do enjoy the Bragg's nutritional yeast. Uh, it comes in a container. And um, that, that is, is good for me. Unfortunately, with COVID still a big part of our lives, my options for bulk aren't as great as they used to be. But you might want to give that a try. And the other thing you might want to do is um, if it's the texture that you're concerned about, you could put it into a spice grinder or a mini food processor and just give it a couple of buzzes to sort of change the texture a little bit. What are your thoughts about using plant-based meats as a transition for such things like chili or pasta bolognese? We've done it in our home and find it quite easy and tasty to adapt. Okay, so if you were going to look at the label, of some of those um, faux meats. Um, they have high fat content and a high sodium content. And if those are the things that you were trying to move away from, um, I happen to be a fan of the, um, the Ruby Satan uh, recipe where I have made sausages from it and I personally feel a lot better knowing that I've made something from scratch. I also, in my own home, make a terrific sausage from um, oatmeal and a lot of spices, and then I wrap it in wet rice paper and then bake them in the oven and they come out just like sausages. So if you're going to help transition your family to using faux meats, how do you transition them from the faux meats to eating more leafy greens? So that's something you can discuss. If you're not eating real animals, I think that's a, a good way to go. It's just not my personal practice. This is from Barbara H who says, hi, Char. Uh, you spoke about onion skins for stuff, but I've wondered about using garlic and ginger skins uh, in the actual recipes. How do they affect the taste and nutrition? You know what, you can throw anything in your stock. Uh, some things might have to be taken out sooner so that they don't become bitter or overpowering. But I find that um, the realness of using those uh, scraps, and I think we have to give them a new name because scraps doesn't sound good at all. Maybe residual produce. I don't know. But um, anything will work. Uh, I think it's pronounced Marcy. Uh, Marcy B, you just said you do not recommend smoothies. Can you explain why? Um, I'm not a registered dietitian. I'm not a physician, but I will give you this easy explanation is two. First of all, digestion begins by chewing. It starts in the mouth. So when you um, drink down your smoothie, um, you're, you're, not, you're not chewing it will elevate your, your blood sugar a little bit more quickly. Um, I've known Dr. Esselstyn for a long, long time, and that's one of the pillars of his own practice. And so in my own personal kitchen, it's something that I choose to adhere to. But if you want to eat a smoothie um, and it's loaded with uh, you know phytonutrients, 
and it tastes good to you, I say, enjoy it. Uh, this is from Karen. Hi, Shara. Were you a chef prior to becoming a plant-based chef? So I'll tell you this. I grew up in my grandparents' Italian restaurant. My biological father was a chef uh, in New York City. Um, I worked at Whole Foods Market for 10 years, and I have just always been interested in food. I've worked at relatives' restaurants, so it's just something that I think is part of my, literally part of my DNA. And Ruby was a nice bridge to all of that. Oh my gosh, Kathy from Dansko is here. Hi, Kathy, how are you? I haven't seen you since you were at uh, Westchester University three years ago this March. Well, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. I'm wearing a pair right now. Uh, there's a Dansko outlet near my house. I go twice a year to fill up on shoes. Hope you and your husband at the University of Delaware are well. Okay, a little homecoming there. Uh, this is from uh, Donna Lee, pretty name. Following the question about no fat, I love black tea, but always drink it with ooh, half and half cream or sometimes milk. To be more plant-based, I have been trying a coconut cream, almond creamer, product called uh, Califia Farm. Uh, and it still has fat in it, okay, ideas. I'm not a tea drinker, but I do love a good cup of coffee. And uh, one of the things that I do for myself is I make my own almond milk and it just has a richer flavor and it's a little thick. Um, I enjoy that. I, I think that saying adios to the half and half is a great thing. And then leaning into the Calipia uh, might be a good idea, but read the ingredients because there's a lot of other stuff in there that you might not want to uh, try, but also making your own nut milks might be another good way to uh, to start. Okay. In rough percentages, and this is from Sarah B, do you make one third of your food grains, starches, legumes, one third greens, and one third vegetables? I'm trying to get the health benefits without getting fat. And last time I went vegetarian, I gained weight. So that's a tricky question. Uh, I'll tell you what I had for dinner last night. Um, last night for dinner, I had a salad that was this big and had about six cups of fresh greens on it. And I had about uh, four ounces of air fried tofu I find staying away from, for me personally, breads and pastas and things like that is a slippery slope for me. Um, I think the other important thing is adding exercise to your life, but making sure that you get those uh, six cups of leafy greens in, even if they're cooked is very important. So, hey Denise, uh, I would love, love, love your sausage recipe. I miss Italian sausage so much. So Denise, I will, uh, I'm going to have to, I, I have it in the shoe box. It's one of my best recipes. Uh, I will write it up and send it to Patrick. And um, essentially it is uh, some oatmeal with a lot of garlic and uh, fennel and oregano and uh, red pepper flakes. And seriously, when you slice it, it looks just like an Italian sausage. So I'll be happy to share that with you. So this is from Polona K. I guess I'm very lucky with my partner loving everything I cook. That's fabulous. Transforming into plant-based diet was easy. After I learned to make tasty plant-based foods with Ruby. People visiting our house don't really notice that they eat vegan food. Well, I think that has a lot to do with how you cook. And again, um, I have millions of cookbooks, but my quick go-to if I'm in the middle of something and I might want to add a little something extra, Ruby is definitely the way to go. So congratulations to you, Paloma, and you, Paloma, and you might want to share some of your techniques with your friends and family as well. Thank you so much for sharing. Here is a comment from Kate P. Hello, Kate. She has a comment about Fran's vegan dessert class. 
It was phenomenal and provides lo a lot of incredible vegan dessert recipes, which made my family and friends very happy. I highly recommend this Ruby class. And, uh, you know, I've known Fran Costigan for as long as I've been plant-based. And um, I just want to share this quick story, and Fran's probably laughing to herself already, but um, if you hang around with Fran Costigan or you follow her on social media, you realize that portion has a lot to do with everything. So for my birthday one year, she knows that my favorite one of my favorite dried fruits happens to be prunes. I'm Italian, we like prunes. And she made me prune truffles. And I was so excited. And in my mind, when I hear the word truffle, I think of something about a little smaller than a golf ball, maybe the size of a Brazilian brigadeiro or something like that. And when I opened the box, they were this big. And it told me immediately that portion is everything that you do. And I think Fran is the best baker. Uh, she's a wonderful friend, but she's also a really good teacher. So thank you for saying that. And I'm, I think I see her shining face um, on this grid today. So uh, hopefully she's heard all of this uh, positive energy sent her way. Thank you so much. What brought you to plant-based eating? My husband wants to do the Atkins diet. Sorry. And I am just cringing. He refuses to watch any health documentaries. So the quickest story is that I owe everything that I am today to Whole Foods Market. I was a marketing team leader at a suburban Philadelphia store. I went to a meeting. Our regional president said, this new book is coming out. You've got to read it. Look at how great I look. And I thought, you know, he really didn't look great. His skin was beautiful. So I stopped at a Borders bookstore on my way home. And I went to a grocery store and I was going to do it for 28 days. And that was 11 and a half years ago. So um, I think a lot of it for me personally uh, came from just a willingness to want to feel better. And um, I think that uh, continuing on your own mission and, uh, you know, to go back to something of uh, uh, friends, make some plant based dessert, start out that way or beautiful salads or some vegetable dishes, um, things that you love. The other thing that I, two things, um, and you can see that this is all tattered, but this is the Jane and Ann Esselstyn Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook. Very good recipes in here. And I just finished reading this one, Healthy at Last by Eric Adams. He was featured in the uh, documentary uh, the Game Changers, and why I liked this book. Um, I interviewed a boxer who's, who has a recipe in here, so I wanted to like be familiar with the recipe. Uh, this is almost written from a guy's point of view, but a different kind of, it's not a bunch of firemen. It's a 55-year-old male who had type 2 diabetes and how he changed his life. So um, the, the Game Changers is a good one because it features the Tennessee Titans in it, and you know how they're all eating vegan food and um, think of it not as a weight loss adventure but as a way to gain better health and i think if you can uh you know i don't know put something under his pillow to change his way of thinking while he's sleeping maybe that will help hi gladys how do i convince a seven-year-old who insists he is not vegan and needs meat um you know, that that is a wonderful, wonderful topic to actually have with everyone because there's a lot of peer pressure. If kids are in school, there's a lot of peer pressure about what they eat. I uh, Every 10 years of my life, I've done something different. So when my kids were growing up, I was a school teacher. So I remember the pressure at a lunchroom when um, we had, be, you know, vegans in, in, in our school. So um, you may want to help have him be in charge. And one other thing uh, when I work with children is um, if you're going to make a sandwich, and this is so easy, um, the bottom is whole wheat bread, the top is white bread. And you make that sandwich, maybe I happen to love the ruby tuna list salad. So maybe you make that, but on the top is that white bread. And not everybody eats whole wheat bread, but everybody knows what white bread is. So little incremental changes like that might help him. Hope that helps. 
So this is from Vicki S. Oh, hi, Vicki. Um, you limited limiting your fruit origin. Is that because you want to decrease your environmental footprint? Uh, also, can you tell us anything about the PLU codes on the fruits? Thanks. Um, well, what I can tell you is that uh, the fruit codes are universal. So whether you're in England or in France or in Honduras, where I go uh, enough in my life, um, the number nine before the four digit number means that it's organic without generally beginning with a four is that it's conventional. And right now I forget what the eight stands for, but uh, nine always means organic. Hope that helps. Char. Oh, this is from Fran Costigan from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Char, I remember, <laughs> hope she doesn't make me laugh. Char, I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, she's dicing vegetables right now, and she's invited me to come for more truffles. I must drive her crazy because at least once or twice a week, I will call her up and say, you can sit in my back seat. I've got on two masks. I'm wearing a face shield. I'll take you wherever you need to go. Um, so I'm really lucky to have Fran living so close by. And the, the funny part is I went to this Israeli bakery last week and I bought some Bialis. Fran and I are both from New York. And I was so excited to drop them off. And it's it's almost like a, you know, Mission Impossible. You've got to get out of your car. You've got to run up this thing. You've got to drop them off, get back so your car doesn't get towed. And she called me later and she said, thank you so much for the bagels. And I said, bagels, I got you Bialis. She got the bagels. We got the Bialis, but it was still delicious and good. Uh, what is, oh, hi, Don. Uh, this name of this cookbook, I'll hold it up for you again, is called Healthy at Last. It is by Eric Adams. It is um, printed at Hay House. And what I love best about the uh, some of his uh, references, you know, come from Reverend Al Sharpton, Dean Ornish, and Fat Joe. If you have watched um, uh, <clears throat> Spike Lee, he's in a lot of Spike Lee movies. Um, hello, Sarah V. Um, you're very kind. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, okay, happy Tuesday. Ideal for meal plans for a house with teenagers who eat and feel fullest with pasta. It's the go-to, but I'm not a fan of pasta flour-based meals. Struggle. Find variety and feeling satisfied. Uh, full with meals beyond beans for fiber. So Google a uh, cashew-free um, mac and cheese dish. I personally take a parsnip, some carrots, some onions, and some Yukon gold potatoes, a little bit of turmeric, and I braise them in the oven slowly at a low temp, and then I just puree the heck out of it, and it comes out to be this delicious, cheesy, cheesy sauce. Add some vegetables. You're going to have to go with some pasta, but you could go with some of the newer vegetable-based vegetable -based pastas that don't have as much flour in them, but actually use, uh, you know, dehydrated uh, vegetable flours and things like that. That would be my go-to. Yeah. And also, people don't believe me when I tell them this, but I never ate tofu. I thought it was the most horrible food in the world. I used to say to people, I don't want to eat foods that feels like my thigh, because that's what tofu felt like to me. But that Ruby assignment was the total game changer. And some of you have probably seen in your assignments when I grade them, this recipe was a game changer for me. So you could also, I like, I prefer it cubed so that all sides get nice and, you know, dark and brown. And also go to the, um, the penne pasta uh, cream sauce recipe where there's some peas in it and there's some smoked tofu. Everyone loves that recipe, so that might be another thing for you to think about. Hi, Carrie. I have thought about doing a food prep list recipe subscription for a month, looking at clean food, dirty girl, trying to choose one that has solid recipes 
haven't liked some of the forks over knives ones I have tried recommendations. Well, here's what I'm going to say. You probably have an arsenal of favorite recipes that you like in your family recipe magic box or whatever. But um, if you like clean food, dirty girl, uh, give it a try. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, it's like they say, take what you want and leave the rest behind and let us know how it works for you. But the recipes here are great. I have to say that. Okay, Karen, here we go. So six cups of greens a day would be a raw measure, not cooked greens. I often wondered if we are getting enough on a daily basis. So just keep in mind, those six cups of spinach, when you cook them down, there's not a lot on your plate. By the way, um, I often get asked that calcium question, broccoli, collards, bam, bam, boom. You, you don't ever need to drink milk again because the collards and broccoli are packed with calcium. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, have you succeeded at making homemade oat milk? I have tried, but it tastes nothing like store-bought. I like the Planet Oats brand. Yeah, that's a lot of sugar in it. Um, which reminds me, uh, before I fully answer your question, Joel, one of the things that I suggest to people is to try a plant milk a week and let your family decide which one they like the best. So in this house, uh, when I don't make my own milk, uh, I buy an unsweetened vanilla because I need that little hint of vanilla. So back to the oat milk. The other thing about oat milk is that if you over blend it, it comes out like wallpaper paste. So what I recommend when I teach plant milk classes is to put it through a double mesh strainer so that you get some of the, lack of a better word, glop out of it. And then I add a little bit of vanilla and that seems to work very, very well. So oat milk is the cheapest one to make um, and it has become very, very popular and it is still as expensive as some of the other, uh, you know, nut-based rend renditions that should be more expensive. Hello, Angela P. Uh, yes, this will be available for replay. Our dynamic master, Patrick, who takes care of everything, who walked me off the cliff 20 minutes before this phone call began. Yes, yes, yes. Um, oh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Kathy has let us know that the eight stands for uh, being genetically modified. And definitely that is something that you do not want to, to uh, eat. So thank you so much for saying that I had, I had a little bit of a brain freeze there. Thank you. This is from Vicki H. There are a lot of frozen meatless products on the market. How healthy are they? And do you recommend using them? Well, I make a really good veggie burger. I don't want to brag. So um, make a batch, you put them in the freezer. I'm not sure that I want to eat a burger that has a lot of added oil and sodium in it. Uh, so if you find a burger that you like, um, Boca Burger has the Boca original. It has a gram of fat. Um, I think that that's probably the lesser of any of evils. Um, there are some products that my friends love. Um, my friends love the Good Catch Crab Cakes. Philly's a big crab cake city, so people love those. And actually here in this region, they're available at your conventional grocery store. The dish I miss most from my meat days, oh, that's so cute, uh, is chicken broccoli casserole. Is there a good chicken alternative you can recommend? Well, again, I'm probably not the best person for this. Um, I know some people have recreated their chicken broccoli casseroles by using some of the Jardine uh, chicken, uh, like they have like a little chicken cutlet or a scallopini or something like that. And, you know, if that's your lean in, um, then try and make it. And I bet your family would love it, especially if you use the cashew cream sauce that we have here at Ruby, uh, which is totally delicious. 
Um, I don't understand why you don't buy anything from Brazil. Oh, I lived in Brazil for two years. I love Brazil. I am just thinking about my carbon footprint and I'm thinking about uh, trying to stay as local as I can. I lived in Minas Gerais, I lived in Espirito Santo, and I finished in living in Pernambuco, and I always have saudades for Brazil, and I keep telling Fran that she needs to make me some vegan brigadeiro. So, uh, Maria, I, I send uh, a lot of abraços to you. Uh, have you tried Georgian food recipes? We have so many vegan foods. I have not, but I'm going to put that on my list. Um, I'm going to take a, a one second break here. And um, this is from the University of California at, Res uh, at Davis. And I, I know I showed it to you earlier, but just remember that it has this little card in it so that when you go grocery shopping, you can keep this uh, resource in your wallet so that when you're shopping, and we did give you the, um, the link to that today. And also, uh, Patrick and I have provided you with some, uh, an article from PCRM uh, about getting the family on board and a couple of other resources that you might find helpful. Okay, this is from Rich. I have heard that if you cook any food above 107 degrees, you will kill all of the enzymes and nutrients. If that is true, how do you avoid this and still cook foods with heat? Well, you know what, Rich, I'm not a raw food expert and I would not eat a raw potato. So um, maybe uh, that's a question that I can uh, research for you. I have a food dehydrator. I often dehydrate um, zucchini to make zucchini chips, to make eggplant, and but I cook those even above 107 degrees. So. Very good question, thank you. How do you balance the sharing of the cleanup duties after going plant-based? I now hate to scrub, ooh, yeah. Uh, you know what, I'm with you, uh, Chris. I don't, I don't touch those dishes. I didn't make the mess, I'm not gonna clean it up. Um, and you know, I have to say that after a while, it just becomes the norm of how things go here at 928 Wild Avenue. Um, Good, good, good reality question. Okay, and this is for Karen. Karen, you can use things like spiraled vegetables in place of pasta. Oh, that, you know what, I hadn't thought of that, but using a spiralizer. Uh, and if you don't have a spiralizer, you can make a nice pappardelle by uh, using a good uh, potato peeler to get some nice thick ribbons of carrots or zucchini or, uh, you know, whatever it is that you like. But thank you very much for saying that's a great, great idea. Read question about milk for tea or coffee. Consider ripple milk, pea protein based, creamy, and does not take community water for those. You know, that's a good suggestion. Um, I know some people who love ripple. Um, I have never tried it because it reminds me of a god awful wine from the 1960s that was also called Ripple. And I'm not sure why it's called that, but their packaging is great. And Karen, that is a great idea. Thank you so much. This is from Chris again. Uh, thanks, Char. We are a non oil, and I'm having trouble finding a nut free cheese sauce without cashews, et cetera. Got a recommendation. Um, that's a hard one. However, um, Rich Roll's wife has a book on cheese. It's called Nuts About Cheese, but I believe every recipe in there is cheese-based. Um, I just don't eat cheese. I mean, I just don't. Uh, you'll never hear me say in a cooking class, nutritional yeast tastes just like cheese, because you know what? It really doesn't. So I don't want to disappoint everybody. Uh, good question. I'm going to look into that. Um, is there a good source of ideas for various ways of using tofu? I've been stuck on one way, dicing up the bricks and baking them and then adding them to salads. Well, I like to drain my tofu for about four hours. I want to get about four ounces of that residual liquid out so that I have a really dry, dry tofu. Some of you may know from your assignments, some of you will write, 
I'm sorry that this is overcooked. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that looks perfect. But I like to cook it a little brown. But, you know, you can bread it. You can um, pan fry it without oil. I have an air fryer that is the most utilized small appliance in my house. I make croutons from it. Um, I use it as a main dish. You can make an oil-free mushroom gravy to put over it. There are countless things to do. You just have to sort of think outside the brick, so to speak. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, I struggle to eat leafy greens. I currently follow the keto diet, and sometimes I just want a quick veggie side, nothing to cook. I eat raw broccoli, but I can't seem to eat salads, aside from green smoothies, which I never finish. How can I enjoy leafy greens? Well, here's what I might add. Sometimes uh, we're deterred by liking or making a salad because we have to make it. So when you get those leafy greens into your home, have them salad ready. I know uh, many students set up mini salad bars in their uh, refrigerators so they can pull some greens, add some radishes, add some cucumber or whatever. Um, I think that's a, a, a good, a really good question because I often do hear people saying that they do struggle to eat leafy greens, but making um, sushi rolls in collards is delicious. Um, there are just so many different things to do. Instead of making, um, putting your tunula salad in a romaine boat, put it in a curly leaf kale boat and uh, enjoy it that way. I think you have to think outside the box. I'm gonna come to your house and set you up with a salad bar. Thanks, Tiffany. So this is from Christine, also sweetening with dates that you can soak along with the nuts and then blend in a blender along with a whole vanilla bean, makes delicious nut milks. Another very, very good, good point. And, um, you know, I love dates. They're a good source of potassium. They've got some fiber in them. Um, I was telling Fran the other day, I made some cookies for a friend and they did not even have maple syrup in them because I cut the dates up so finely that they provided the source of sweetness uh, that was in there. So that is a great idea to put into homemade plant milks. Thank you so much for that, Christine P. Okay. Can you recommend a meal planning prep program? Also, will you be offering your plant milk class soon? Thank you, Justine. So I'll, I'll take a little spin here. Um, when I left Whole Foods Market, I worked at a company that delivered um, uh, pre-made meals that were made by local Philadelphia chefs. And my job, was to pre-plan four weeks of menus at a time. That was seven days a week, two, three meals and two snacks. And all I did was get a lot of post-it notes and I have a visual board over there and I just put them on there and did that. I know there are a lot of fancy a lot of fancy programs. Engine 2 right now has a meal prep program. I believe Rich Roll has one. Uh, there's a part of me that thinks that there's nothing quite as good as um, a black book to write down and keep notes in. Um, I think it's important that we all rely on ourselves and our own resources so that things feel comfortable to us and what we like and what we want to do. Make a list of every recipe that you have eaten in your life whether your mother, your grandmother, an aunt, an uncle, whomever, um, uh, and see how you can flip them. When I worked at Whole Foods, the person who was my demo person was a vegan. And I hate to say this, but I used to make fun of her. I would be like, oh God, here she comes with her vegan food. And uh, she would say to me, I'm going to take that recipe and I'm going to flip it. And I would be like, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, I'm going to flip it from being a meat-based recipe to being uh, plant-based vegan. And um, the funny story about my good friend Deb is that one day she went to get me a cup of coffee and she came back and pretend that this is the cup of coffee and I drank it and I did a spit take because she put almond milk in it and I was somebody who relied heavily on half an ounce. So back to that tea question, 
lean into things because now today I only drink uh, coffee with uh, either homemade almond or homemade oat milk. Um, and Justine, I, I think that that uh, kind of brings us to an end. I'm going to look through my lovely little notebook because I wanted to leave you with five takeaways. And the first one I like to say is just lean in with love. You know, just enjoy what you do. Enjoy sharing your plant-based knowledge and ability to make beautiful food. And trust me when I tell you, people will come around. Um, I suggest again, watching the documentaries. I forgot to add Game Changers. That might be a good one. Um, with your family or your friends, you're gonna plan together. You're gonna shop together. You're gonna cook together and you're gonna eat together. Uh, I know a lot of people watch TV. Uh, they don't eat at the table. Um, eating at the table is still the best way to connect with anybody who happens to live with you. The other thing I like to, to stress under big letters is make it easy for yourself. Um, do what comes naturally. Again, lean into it and you're going to find lots of new resources. You know, one of the things that I love about Ruby is that it's just chock full of wonderful experiences, amazing expertise. And um, I think there's also a nice camaraderie among the student base. So make it easy together. And uh, the last thing is to just have fun. I mean, you know, we li we're living in crazy times. Um, I haven't been grocery shopping in months. I had my groceries delivered. And for me, going to the grocery store was like going to a high school reunion because you got to see so many wonderful people. And I loved uh, surfing for new products that I could share with students or in classes that I was teaching and things like that. So with that said, I love to, uh, first I wanna thank everyone for joining in today. Uh, the questions were just amazing. I was able to preview some of them with um, Patrick earlier this morning and they're very well thought out questions and I appreciate your patience and I hope that you had a very good time today. And as our fearless leader, Ken Rubin likes to say, Happy cooking.